Welcome back to another episode of Ramiumptum Ruminations. I am the host, Scott. Thanks for listening. Today's episode is On Covenants and the Impermanence of Things. Thank you for giving a new podcast a listen. I appreciate you giving me your time to hear some ruminations on the Mormon or LDS church. In the first episode, we discussed the ship of Theseus and how that thought experiment can be related to the Mormon church and help us understand it as an organization a little bit better. Now, In episode two, we're going to go back to that same thought experiment, but look at it from a little bit different context. And this time, we're going to to look at a, a retelling of the ship of Theseus as it pertains to people. And the specific thought experiment that I want to cover is called the Russian nobleman. As we're looking at this thought experiment and thinking about these things, I want to discuss the impermanence of people and ideas and how everyone changes and what implications that has on the lifelong covenants that we make and how we can better understand those covenants and our relationships with them. With the discussion of covenants, the idea of informed consent is regularly brought up. And informed consent is permission granted with the knowledge of possible consequences. It's typically like a doctor patient sort of thing or referred to with like products or things that you buy. Informed consent would be knowing that there are risks to an operation, that sort of thing. But when we talk about the church, the informed consent is usually talked about regarding not knowing all of the history or not knowing about the promises you're going to make before you make them. I have long thought that informed consent may not be the right terminology for this, but it's the word that we use and it's the word that that people in this sphere understand. As we discussed the ship of Theseus, we talked about the impermanence of things. The fact that the ship of Theseus, as it changed over time, how the ship of Theseus, as each board was replaced over time, that it slowly no longer resembled itself, but was still referred to by the same name, the ship of Theseus. We use this thought experiment specifically to look at an organization, but today I want to use it to look at at people and the idea that people change over time. The same concept can be applied to personality, and identity. So let's jump into it. The thought experiment that I want to cover is called The Russian Nobleman. It was by a guy named Derek Parfit, and he published this in the essay Reasons and Persons in 1984. Here is what he wrote. In several years, a young Russian will inherit vast estates. Because he has socialist ideals, He intends now to give the land to the peasants, but he knows that in time his ideals may fade. To guard against this possibility, he does two things. He first signs a legal document, which will automatically give away the land, and which can be revoked only with his wife's consent. He then says to his wife, Promise me that if I ever change my mind and ask you to revoke this document, You will not consent. He adds, I regard my ideals as essential to me. If I lose these ideals, I want you to think that I cease to exist. I want you to regard your husband then, not as me, the man who asks for this promise, but only as his corrupted later self. Promise me 
that you will not do what he asks. So the thought experiment comes into play that later on in, in the life of this Russian nobleman, he does change his mind. And he wants to revoke this writ that will, that will automatically donate his lands to the people. And in order to retract this, this legal document, he must have his wife's permission. Now, if this man asks his wife later on in life, how should she respond? Should she ignore what her husband says in his later years because she promised him the opposite in their younger years? Should she deny the older nobleman and hold true to what, they, what the, she promised? Or should she give in and allow him to change his mind? What would be the right thing to do? It's interesting that he words it like this. He says, I want you to think that I cease to exist. If I lose these ideals, I want you to think that I cease to exist. I want you to regard your husband then not as me, but only as his corrupted later self. If someone changes their mind and believe something different later on in their life? Are they a corrupted version of themselves? This thought experiment is interesting because it's in a negative perspective. It's a man who is deciding against donating his lands to people. But these experiments can easily be altered to a positive light. What if in his earlier years he decided that he did not, he decided that he never wanted to donate his lands and he and he made his wife promise him that she would never let him donate his lands but then in his elderly years he decides that that he does indeed want to donate his his estates when he passes on so the question then becomes would the correct thing for the wife to do in the positive instance be different than the correct thing for her to do in the negative one and why? As you're listening to this, there are some clear parallels to the covenants that we make in the temple and in baptism. And the parallel is directly to those that leave the church. Earlier on in our lives, we made promises to endure to the end. We made promises to stay faithful for the rest of our lives. And we made these promises with our spouses. And in some scenarios, our spouse does not join us down the path of deconstruction. And when we have these conversations with our family members and our loved ones saying, look, I know I made this promise. I know I made this covenant, but I don't believe anymore. And I don't feel bound to that covenant anymore. This moral dilemma this hypothetical is the everyday life of our loved ones that are still in the church. There is a real world example of someone who went through a dramatic change like this. It's a story that gets brought up in neuroscience and in psychology studies. It's a man named Phineas P. Gage. He was a railroad worker in 1823. Now Gage suffered a terrible accident and a, rail, a railway spike punctured through his left eye and his left frontal lobe. Surprisingly, he survived the incident. But it did not leave him, leave him free of other impacts, though. Now Phineas, after the, now Phineas, before the incident, was generally well-liked, according to his friends. But after the incident, he developed... A speech impediment, he was prone to shouting and swearing, and what his friends considered was a, a dramatic change for the worse. After the incident, he lived for another 12 years. And in that time, the friends that he had before the incident no longer referred to Phineas as the same person that he was before the incident. Now, why is that? He's in the same body, 
But why did his did this personality change make him a different person? If somehow my former self, the young man on a mission, fervently praying for a testimony and preaching the scriptures, if I could somehow tell that person where I would be in 15 years, I would never have believed it. I would have looked at the person I am today and said, who is that stranger? In more ways than just testimony and belief, I never could have imagined the person that I became today based on where my life's trajectory was at that point in time. Now, the clear parallels of this story to the Mormon experience are the concept of covenants and promises that we make in our youth and what implications these promises have on us as adults. Just as this Russian nobleman promised that he would give away his land and made his wife promise never to let him change his mind, every active believing member of the church will make covenants both at baptism and in the temple in very much the same manner. We promise a number of things. We never stop to consider, what if I change my mind in the future? Now, something I want to address a little bit is informed consent. That's something that is discussed regularly with this subject. But I want to focus more on the fact that people are impermanent creatures and less on informed consent. Because I do not believe the church gives informed consent to new members of the church or to people preparing to go into the temple. There is no informed consent on either of those covenants that we make. Now, back to the, back to the subject at hand. We all go through and make promises with the idea that our future selves will be the same as our current selves. And what happens, what are we to do when that is no longer the case? As I said at the beginning, this is a variant on the ship of Theseus thought experiment. And it's, it's a, a fascinating thing to think about. It's basically the question of what is a person? Are we the bodies where our mind resides? I don't think we can be our bodies, or at least not just our bodies. Because every seven to ten years, every cell in our body is replaced except for a small lens in our eye. So if we're not just our bodies, are we then our mind and memories? If we don't have our memories then, for those that suffer from Alzheimer's or, or have, or their cognition wears away in their later years, are they no longer themselves? This is a very real example in my life. I have a grandma right now who is suffering from Alzheimer's. She's losing her memories. And for those around her, those of us that love her so much, it feels like she's not herself anymore. She's forgetful. She makes up stories. And, and the, the phrase that comes to mind is that she's almost a shell of her former self. The same question is there. Is my grandma still my grandma? Even though she is losing her memories and her body has been replaced over and over and over again over the course of her life. It's a fascinating thing to think about. And I think we can, I think we can get a little bit of insight into what a person is from a little bit of Buddhist philosophy. If we look at a car and break down a car by each of its parts. Is there any single component in a car that is the car? If you take apart the entire car and lay every piece on the ground in a neat row, got a steering wheel sitting next to a, an engine block sitting next to a battery all down the line until you have every single piece of the car lined up in a neat row. Which one piece of the car is the car? 
the answer to that is clearly is it's not a car unless you have all of them together. And I think that is a healthy way to look at a person. Is all of these things together, the constantly changing cells in their body, the memories that they have been building and putting together over the years, it's each of these pieces are what builds and makes a person. So if someone loses one of those pieces, they're still that same car, just without an engine, or just without a tire but they're still the same thing. Now, if you have an old car and the engine is no longer working and needs to be replaced and you put in a new one, it's the same thing with the ship of Theseus. Is it still the same car? And I want to relate these to ideas. So if if a person gets a new idea in their head, Are they a new person now that they have a new idea in there? As I said, in both of the cases, both the Russian nobleman and the Phineas P. Gage example, we talk about it as a negative change that happens to them and they are no longer themselves. So now that we've done the thought experiment and we're we're ready to look at these covenants, let's talk a little bit about a covenant. So I could go into the Temple Covenant and talk a little bit about that, but out of respect, I'm not going to talk about the Temple Covenants. I have people that I love dearly that find immense value in their worship in the Temple. And I do not want to offend them. So I'm not going to discuss the Temple. But I will discuss the Baptismal Covenant. Because the, all of the information about the baptismal covenant, covenant is available on the church's website. So in the baptismal covenant, there are promises that God makes and there are promises that the member makes. The person promises to take upon themselves the name of Jesus Christ. They promise to keep the commandments and serve the Lord until the end of your life. Now, God promises, on the other hand, the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost, a remission of sins, and being born again. Many peop- many members of the Mormon Church make this covenant when they're very young, when they're eight years old. There are others that make it when they're in their teenage years, and others that make this promise throughout their lives in various stages. But each of them make this promise to endure to the end, to stay faithful to this covenant for the rest of their life. Now, there are similar covenants made in the temple where the implication is service to the church for the rest of your life. Now, while not the subject of discussion for today, it is important to note that these covenants are made with the church. They are not made with God. It is a covenant to serve the church the rest of your life. And that is an important distinction. Making a promise to stay faithful to the church for the rest of your life when you're eight years old. There appears to be a disconnect. And the problem comes from the fact that eight-year-olds are not able to make a commitment for a career at their age, or a spouse, or any other number of lifelong commitments, but we allow them to be made with the church and with God. So I ask the question, what eight-year-old knows the type of person they're going to be when they're 60? Or 70. What eight year old knows the hardships and trying life experiences that they're going to go through in their 20s or 30s? And how those experiences are going to dramatically alter the way they view the world. But they make a promise at the age of eight to endure to the end. There's a narrative in the church 
that is black and white that I do not like. And that is when a non-member learns about the church and they get baptized, they're praised. They're, they're often referred to as courageous for changing their faith. If they change their faith away from their family and they believe something different, they are thought to be as a, as a pioneer and they are honored for going against the grain and believing something different than what their parents taught them for accepting the truth. In my mind, that is no different than a member of our church joining another faith and having the members of this other faith praising a child from the Mormon church for joining the Baptist church, for example. It's all perspective. And that perspective is something I want to discuss in a later episode. But another way to look at this is someone who, who loses their faith or changes what their faith is. In the Mormon church, they're referred to as fallen. How could so-and-so have fallen so far? How could so-and-so have given up on their covenants? But these scenarios are no different. As people grow older, they change their minds. And sometimes when they, when they do change their minds or when they, when they learn something new, this new knowledge, this new evidence puts them in a position where they have to alter their faith. And that is okay and normal. Every thinking adult can make their own choice of what church to join or to join any at all. There is value in a secular life, just as there is value in a religious one. Now, as we've established, the people are impermanent and, and always shifting and changing based on the events in their life, based on their trauma or their loved ones. There is not a single person that believes all the same things they did when they were eight. Unless, of course, you're still eight. But regardless, there's not a single adult that believes and thinks the way they did when they were a child. Not a single person. So let's say, for example, that you had to choose your career at the age of eight. What career would you be doing now? And do you think that would be f fulfilling? Would it be reasonable to make an informed decision about your life when you're an adult instead of relying on the on the decisions that you made when you were a child. I had an interesting experience, one of those cliche romantic moments when I was a young man. I found myself on Halloween night sitting on the roof of a girl that I thought was very cute. Out of respect, I won't say her name. I know that she at the time was a member of the church, but I don't know. We're not in contact anymore. And we were sitting on her roof discussing when the next full moon would happen on Halloween night. And we did the math and we found out how old we would be and we were talking about where we might be in the world and what sorts of things we might be doing. And then the thought occurred to both of us. We promised each other that when that full moon came, we would look each other up, find out if the other person was married or not, if neither of us were married, we would find each other and we would go get married. It's a romantic thought straight out of a storybook. But it brings up an interesting idea. What if we did look each other up? Let's say I wasn't married and neither was she and we looked each other up. We would not hold the same ideals. We may not have the same things in common. I may not be attracted to her anymore. But we made a promise when we were kids on her roof. Should we be held responsible for a promise that we made? We could be completely incompatible as a couple, but we made that promise. I see covenants with the church as no different than marriage covenants. I don't think they should be interpreted any differently than that. 
if you are in an unhealthy marriage, it is perfectly acceptable to get a divorce in order to live a healthy life. If it's an unhealthy relationship, it is perfectly healthy to go to therapy and have both spouses make the adjustments and changes needed for it to be a healthy marriage. With these examples, it is perfectly acceptable to end an unhealthy marriage if the marriage is not good for your mental health or your physical health. If it's abusive in any way, then it is 100% okay to get out of the marriage. It's the same thing with a relationship with a church. There is nothing wrong with ending a relationship with the church if it's unhealthy for you. If the theology causes you to have mental issues, anxiety, depression, scrupulosity, that is reason enough to divorce yourself from the church, to step away for your mental health. In some cases, the church is physically harmful to people. And again, it is perfectly acceptable to step away. And in other cases, the church is uplifting and helpful and spiritual and a wonderful place to worship. And that is also valid. When the idea of covenants is brought up, it's usually discussed with the concept of informed consent and how if you don't have informed consent, that's reason enough. And it is. That's fine. If you, if, if a person goes and learns about the history of the church and decides that that's enough for them to leave, then that's enough. You are under no obligation to justify your reasoning for leaving the church to anyone. If you're married, I would recommend talking to your spouse, but that can be a a very hard conversation. In my marriage, it was a little bit unconventional. I'll talk about this more at a later time, but I had deconstructed belief in the Old Testament first, and it was a very hard thing for me. I still believed in the Mormon church, and I was active and devout, but I did not believe in the Old Testament. And I went to my wife and I told her that I did not believe in the Old Testament. And she looked at me. She didn't really know how to respond. And I assured her but that I still believed in the Book of Mormon and that I still believed in the New Testament. So I, sh- I was able to make it work still. And that was comfort enough for her. But then each step of the way, as I deconstructed more and more and learned more and more, each step of the way, it was harder for her to watch me separate myself. I would recommend having these conversations as early as possible because someone on this path of deconstruction, wherever you land theologically, you need to have an open conversation with your partner if you are married. I'll discuss my story at length, perhaps at another time, but the pertinent concepts for this are what I just said. As we're going through these changes, as we're thinking about leaving the church or changing our relationship with the church. If we're married, you have to you have to be aware of how that will impact your spouse. You have to discuss that with them because they have every right to know as your spouse. Especially if you are married in the temple. For many many couples it is not an explicit understanding, but it's implicit that you will stay faithful for your whole life. So if you make a change, you have broken this this unspoken commitment. People change. People change their ideas politically. People change their ideas theologically. And there's nothing wrong with that. So the question then becomes, back to this Russian nobleman thought experiment. Should you be held accountable for a promise you made when you believed something different? Should I be held accountable to my baptismal covenants that I made? when I now identify more as an agnostic than a Christian? Should I be held accountable for those covenants that I made when at the time I believed something entirely different? For me, the answer is no. I can't tell anyone how to interpret anything, but that is the conclusion that I come to. 
It's just like this young woman I chatted with on the roof. We made that promise when we were kids. We can't be held accountable for decisions we made when we're eight. We can't. It's silly. But the same goes if you're 18 or 32 and you make this this covenant for baptism. And then years later you find out that, that maybe you didn't have informed consent. Perhaps these pretenses that informed every decision you made in your life were false. You were under no obligation to live up to a covenant that you no longer believe in. But you don't need me to tell you that. You have the power and autonomy as an adult to make that decision on your own. But you can't make that decision for other people. This theme is dancing around the idea of informed consent, and try, and I'm trying to reframe it in a way where, regardless if you have informed consent or not, if you believed everything from the beginning or knew every fact or detail about the church from the beginning, it is still valid to decide to leave. But the church does have a history problem. The church does have significant problems with the way it treats LGBTQ plus members. And there's no getting around that. That's just, that's just the case. That's just how it is. And the problem with this informed consent idea is that members of the church make decisions in their lives about having children, about how many children to have, about who to marry and when to marry, and what career to pursue, sometimes where to live and what school to go to. All of these, are de- these decisions are informed by belief. They're informed by belief in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. If that belief is based on false pretenses and inaccurate retellings of history, that is not fair to the members. It is not fair to the struggling young couple going into debt because they have a kid way too young and can't afford it. I could list countless other examples of how that's not fair to people because religion is a deciding factor in many people's lives. And if their belief is not based on what actually happened, it's it's just not right. I don't want to exclude the, the option for someone to be believing. It is okay to research and understand the difficult history, but still land on the believing side of the spectrum. That is fine. That's okay to understand that the prophets were were just human and they made mistakes. That's good. That's a healthier way to look at them than infallible men. No one has to justify the reason for staying or leaving to anyone else. If it works for you, that's great. If it doesn't, that's also valid. But both the believer and the non-believer deserve to know the actual history of the church. It's not a matter of wanting to hide something or preserve a narrative. The question that many people bring up is, is whose responsibility is it to study and learn what actually happened in history? Is it on the church? Does the the responsibility lie with the church to tell its members everything? Or is the responsibility on the individual, on the member, to do their own research and study? This is where it's a little bit of a two-way street. Yes, the church doesn't give informed consent to its members. That's a fact. But it's also on the member to have the desire to study and learn for themselves. If the person is not willing to put in the effort to do any research, then... It's on them for not having learned. So in my case, for example, I didn't study church history until I became a gospel doctrine teacher. I believed my whole life, but I didn't start studying it really hard until I became a gospel doctrine teacher. 
So I will accept part of this blame. I will say that perhaps I didn't take my scripture study as seriously as as I needed to. But a large portion of the blame goes to the church for actively hiding it for a hundred plus years. Actively hiding it when B.H. Roberts presented all of the anachronisms to the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve, and he was ignored. The church has actively hidden this information. And so, a large portion of the blame for this history problem, if you will, is on the church. It's delicate, because my relationship with the church is bittersweet. I've had so many fond memories of my time as a Mormon. I met some of my best friends in the Mormon church, and without the church, I would have never met them. I have had a close friend that I met in church since I was eight. And we are still very close friends to this day, to the point where we text almost every day. We hang out very regularly. Still, I have been friends with this guy for over 25 years. And I met him through the church. So I I can't say that the organization is all bad and that everything from it is bad. Because that's not the case. And it's not fair to say that or to treat it like that. But I don't want to diminish the harm that it has done to other people. The harm that it did to me later on in my life. It is a complex, multifaceted issue. The point of this discussion is to empower the listener to be able to make their own choices in their life, free of the dictates of a promise they made when they were a child. I hope that you found today's episode insightful, that it perhaps challenged your thinking in certain areas. If this sort of content is something that you enjoy, please like and subscribe and share this podcast with your friends. I would greatly appreciate you helping me get the word out. I'm a brand new podcast and I need as many new listeners as I can get. The idea of the inconstancy of people is a subject that I'll bring up in in future podcasts. This idea, this truth that nothing is constant is liberating. And look at what relationship the truth that every person and every being in this world is constantly changing, and what relationship that has with the covenants that we make to churches. There is nothing wrong with staying in the church. There is nothing wrong with leaving the church. I believe there are things that the church needs to change, but as a whole, it is a good organization. Can it be better? Of course it can. Thank you for listening to today's episode. I hope that you have an excellent day.